Tuesday, May 24th. Congratulations. We're going to see what happens as we begin the experiment of trying it on my phone. So. Are you mad? Yeah, that's pretty much a given. Uh, let's see. And then you guys have that thing going in the signing over there. And then, uh, you might be able to feel it uh, at home if you put your hand on the screen right here and touch this. You'll be able to feel the level of heat in my room uh, because for some reason the heat is going on May 24th. And so I'm currently sweating. Um, it has reached about 90 degrees. And so it's all good. And so we can like touch our hands together and you'll feel the heat emanate from here. Child! Yes, if there's no one over there, go for it. That's fine. That's. Then we'll go down to the 150. <laughs> more than 100. Wait, more than 100. Good job. Some numbers. All right. And to there. Uh, I don't care about that. Uh, pictures I added that we'll get to here in a moment. Did I, where exactly did I leave off with you guys yesterday? Uh, you you just finished shoplifting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I was, was just nice. going yeah. into the police car. Like, yeah, that mom, like, hit her child. Sadness. Um, and so, yeah, I went back and found... The, the pictures I was able to add in for next year's kid, if I can at least help you guys out. Uh, that was the crawl space window that I talked about. I did the little snakely thing over uh, the utility door, and I talked about having to push it into the middle, and it did the snappy thing, and it had the slats. That's what the little slatty door looked like. Um, and then I created, from the best I could remember it, from 33 some years ago, uh, the house layout, where it had uh, the utility room pop out, and the stairs that went above it, and then the front door, and I think that was a garage over there. I never really played in that area. Uh, and then it ran around in that area. So that's what the house layout was. I was able to use that to tell the story. And then for the CVS, that was the, well, not, it wasn't the CVS, it was something else, I don't know, uh, Oscar. Anyway, it was a glass front doors that had a little double door area that you walk through. And the store layout when I did the thieving and the stealing and the poor choicing. Um, and did I tell you, some of the classes I forgot to tell how I, it, I figured out later on how it was that I got caught. Yeah. 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 Glass glass wall. So you guys, the ones that I told, I think I forgot to tell all my other classes the fact that it was the glass wall. And of course, I was the idiot that forgot to plug in the sound. All that yelling earlier. All right. Hey, we'll see if it still works. Um, and so, walking out. Oh, this is going to kill me in this heat. Um, so I was walking out to the, the police car, and I, I tell you about the four heads that were over to the right? No. So as I, as he's walking me out through the, the doors, and I remember as I looked over to the, my right, because the, the, not the siren, but the lights were going, and as he walked me out to his car, I could look over to my right-hand side, the, down the length of the building, and there were four heads popping around the side of the building, looking down towards us. Um, and it was four of my friends who had stayed back to watch me get arrested because that's what true friends do. Uh, they watch you get put into a police car so they can make fun of you for years and years after that. And so the cops saw them also. And then I remember him laughing, like, huh, you've got a criminal fan club, um, which mm, didn't make me feel happy whatsoever. Um, and then as he put me into the police car, there, uh, I remember there was a shotgun bolted into the dash area. And so as I had to sit down, I had to move my head around where the shotgun was. I couldn't move easily because my hands were still handcuffed behind me the entire time. And so he had to help me sit down. So he was like holding my arm and I was trying to sit into it. And the shotgun was like pointed right at my nose for emergency shotgunning of people, I guess. That's why the cops have it. And so I moved my head around that and then sat down. And he had to put the seatbelt on me because I couldn't move from it. And then uh, once he put the seatbelt on, before he shut the door, I remember him saying one last thing to me. He looked down and he goes, it's a short drive to the police station. Try not to steal anything while you're in my car. And it was just a, mm, an extra little moment of him crushing my soul. And then he slammed the door, then he came and got in the car and drove. And in Noblesville, uh, it's a small town, and so the police station literally was like a two minute drive from where we were at the school. And so we, uh, got to the, the police station. I don't remember everything from there. Um, I don't remember going into the police station. I just remember being in uh, his little, I guess it was an office. I guess it was his desk and he sat behind it and there was a little chair. And at some point he took the cuffs off me, but I don't remember him taking the cuffs off either. But I, I know I didn't have them on forever. So I remember sitting in the little chair and he was at the desk on the other side of it and he took down like my information and had to fill out a report of some kind and he called my mom which was not a fun conversation to listen to because I could only hear his half of it. Um, he was like, you know, hi, you know, 
verified who she was. He's like, I, I have your son here. He was picked up for shoplifting. Uh, you're going to need to come pick him up. And she was at work, so she had to get off work early to come get me. And I remember just sitting there and going through my head and wondering how this was going to change my life. Um, what my friends were going to think, because obviously they knew about it because they watched, um, whether they would still talk to me after this, and then wondering, being the fact that I was a good kid and I was in like the advanced classes and honor science, stuff like that, um, what my teachers were going to think and that, what that was going to ruin for me. Um, and then also so far as wondering, um, girls, whether they would ever talk to me again. It was like, I was like, I'm never going to get a chance to go on a date. That's what girls want to date, 14 year old who has a criminal record uh, and is such a raging idiot. And so all those thoughts were going through my head as I was sitting there um, waiting and the guy was just doing his little tappy tap writing report. And I kept sitting there waiting. Eventually he um, noticed me because I was looking at one of the walls that had wanted posters all over it. And I saw those wanted posters, but I'd never seen wanted posters in real life. I thought they were kind of cool. And so I was sort of entertaining myself once again, trying hard not to cry, uh, trying to, to man up. Uh, and I kept looking at these little wanted posters on the side wall that was over to my right. And I remember him looking up and seeing me looking at those wanted posters. And then he just said, oh, so you're going to be up there someday, huh? That's where I'm going to find you too? And it was just that little, uh, that deflating little feeling of the guy making fun of me. It just hurt. And I was like, no. And he was like, yeah, every criminal says that. And it just that was like, uh, so I like stopped looking around the room and just like started like staring down at the ground the whole time. And I remember my mom eventually came to get me. Um, and when she did, she didn't yell at me. Uh, it was just that disappointed as she came in. And she's like, I'm so disappointed in you. And I'm like, uh, it's kind of disappointed in me too. Um, and then they, they checked me out of the, the police station. Um, and we drove home. I still remember it was a uh, gray Pontville. Uh, Bonneville. Pontiac Bonneville was the car. And I remember sitting in the, the passenger seat, in the front seat, um, and my mom drove, and her not yelling at me, just saying, you know, we thought we raised you better. Who would do such a thing? What's wrong with you? What did we do wrong? And that kind of thing, where it's just that whole guilt and feeling bad. And I remember driving home with her, uh, sitting in that front seat, I had my feet up on the dash, and wrapping my arms around my knees, and leaning my head against uh, the cool window and just staring out the window the whole time we were driving home watching um, the trees go by and just the same things I'd wondered before wondering if this was the thing that that ends me um, how do you come back from this being the beginning of your freshman year and being 14 years old and now having a criminal record and it seemed to me like there it's it that's done that this is not something you recover from and we got home, and my mom just said, I think you should probably head up to your room. And I was like, I think that's a good idea, too. And so I went up to my room and just laid on my bed and stared at the ceiling um, and just felt horrible. Uh, that despair, depression, feeling awful, all of that just sort of went through my head. And um, laying there, and I remember hearing my dad get home, and I heard them talk downstairs, and there was no yelling or anything like that, just the, them conversing. And then they came up to talk to me around dinner time, um, and they sat down, and they were like, all right. Here's what's going to happen moving forward. I go, yeah. They go, you're grounded indefinitely for now. I'm like, this is not something we have experience with, so we're not really sure how long to ground you for. And I was like, yeah, I kind of figured that one. And they go, as of now, that's it. I remember looking up, and I was a little surprised. I go, what? And they go, hun, I don't think you understand that your life changes from this point forward. No one's going to view you the same way that they viewed you before from this day on. You're a criminal now. There's nothing we can do to punish you that's going to be worse than what life does to you moving forward. The worst punishment we can give you is making you go to school tomorrow. Um, and they were right. That was about the worst punishment they could come up with. Uh, and my parents were very supportive of me after that. They're like, you understand that we're disappointed in you and the fact that we don't trust you anymore, but we still love you and we'll still be there for you, but you're going to have to learn to deal with this and you're gonna to have to come to terms with the choices you made, which was deep uh, and painful. Uh, and so the next day, they made me go to school, uh, which was as awful as I feared it would be. Um, because this was before social media and before cell phones and stuff like that, so it wasn't a matter of kids posting about it online. I didn't have to worry about my friends texting me. No one was going to call my house that night. So that whole evening, there was no contact with the outside world. It wasn't until I got to school the next day. Um, and of course, 
it traveled everywhere because the wrestlers all knew about it. And so the wrestlers all told the other wrestlers about it. And so it was, um, it was rough walking around the school that day. Um, and everyone asking me about it and me trying to, to blow it off as best I could, but there's no easy way to blow off that decision like that. It was just awful the whole way through. And it was the little things that people did uh, that hurt the most, that you don't pay much attention to. Uh, the fact that people's opinions of you change. Walking into my advanced English class, uh, these kids who I'd known for years that I'd always been friends with before, and they would see me and they would do little things like just um, moving their stuff to one side so it wasn't near me, like I was going to walk by and just steal it. Uh, they would like move their pencil pouches or their books and just their ways that they looked at me and they would their eyes would squint and you could tell that they were trying to figure out what kind of person I was and it was rough um, and so little thing I mean there's always the idiots that then just yell thief and stuff like that and would make fun of you um, I got the nickname yeah I just tossed right in there um, Banaka after that and that's what kids would just say like hey Banaka uh, or they'd call me breath spray or something along those lines because kids are cruel uh, it keeps life fun uh, and so, had that going on, um, which was for weeks that that would happen, uh, 100 points and higher if you want to head on over. Uh, and so, it was weeks that that, that happened. Um, and it was tough because eventually I did have to go before a judge. If you've ever been to Noblesville, they have a town square that's in the middle of it, and they have that big building. Uh, that's where I had to go before a judge, and so I got called in to, um, I had to dress up in like a nice little suit with my mom one day, and I got to miss school in the morning and go and sit in front of a judge, and I got called up, and so, hey kiddo. Hi. And so I had to go and um, present the case. I had a lawyer that was there and all that, and the judge was like, you've never been in trouble before, and I was like, apparently I haven't. Uh, because that's the thing when I was seven years old, apparently that did not officially go on my record. So I was like, I have not been in trouble before. That is correct. I'm a good child. And so they're like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We are going to give you what's called deferred punishment. And I was like, I, I don't know what that means. And they go, well, what it means is I'm not going to do anything to you right now. What you're going to get is essentially a slap on the wrist. Um, and so what we're going to officially do is in the records on with uh, the police record, you're going to have one until the day you turn 18. And what it means is if your name gets run through for the police for anything, if you're out after curfew, if you're picked up for drugs and alcohol, if you're caught speeding, anything that you do, your name is going to show up in the fact that you have this hanging on your head. And what it means is if you get picked up with friends doing something wrong, your friends will be let go and you're going to be pulled in before me and you are going to get punished for whatever the new thing is, and you're going to be punished for this too. So this will just be hanging on you, and we're going to defer it, which means put it off until you get caught again. If you don't get in any trouble, then on your 18th birthday it gets expunged, which means it gets wiped out like it never exists. If not, then until the day you turn 18, this will always be there. Anytime you make a poor choice, this will be the first thing that pops up. You will not be able to get in trouble. No cop will ever say, hey, I'm going to let you go, because this will be on there saying, you need to be pulled in in front of me. And I was like, yes, sir. I understand, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, and then eventually I got off. So technically, I was let off at that point. It was just a slap on the wrist, the idea of knowing that anything else I did, it would come back to haunt me. And it did. Um, it's a lot of what kept me making good choices all throughout high school. Uh, because I was paranoid about that. I didn't end up getting into uh, drinking or going to parties after that. And a lot of it was because of this fear. Because uh, I knew if I went to a party and the party got raided, there was no way I was getting out of it. The fact that I was going to get in trouble. Uh, and then the same thing with drugs. Because I was always that and the fact that my family has horrible addiction problems. I was always paranoid. And so it kept me from making those particular choices. So it was never really an option or an issue for me. Um, but moving forward from that, um, it was weeks before um, I was able to move past it as far as school-wise because kids will make fun of you. It's what they did. Um, and it, it was like every day and it was what I had to deal with in every single class period. And I remember it was a few weeks later. I was, uh, it was after wrestling one day and I was sitting in one of the back hallways before a wrestling meet. And I didn't, like when we had the days of wrestling meets, I just stayed at school and did homework in the hallway. Uh, and I remember sitting in the hallway one day uh, waiting for a wrestling meet to start. 
when I looked up and there was this kid walking down the hallway, and I recognized the kid. He was one of our school thugs. Uh, Noblesville has some scary kids that go there, uh, and this is one of the scary kids. Like he'd gotten kicked out uh, for smoking uh, when we were like in eighth grade and stuff like that. Uh, had picked fights with teachers and things like that. So I remember looking me up and seeing him, and I was like, "Oh, poopy!" Uh, and I, like I looked down, like I don't make eye contact, and let that kid. And he kept walking, and eventually, um, not looking up, doing my work, I saw like his feet come right in front of me and stop. And he just stood there, and I was like, "Okay." Can't keep ignoring him because he's kind of right in front of me. So like, I eventually like, put my book down and I looked up and I'm like, hey. He's like, you Broviac? And I'm like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm Broviac. And he was like, you're the kid that got arrested for uh, stealing breath spray a couple weeks ago, aren't you? And I go, yeah, that's, that's me. And he just looked at me for a moment. And it was a, it's an encounter I'll never forget. Because this kid that I had pegged and I thought I knew who he was, I knew exactly why he was going to talk to me, I was wrong. Because he goes, it gets better. I go, what? He goes, the kids, they're making fun of you, aren't they? I go, yeah. He goes, they're giving you a hard time? I go, yeah. He goes, it gets better. I go, what? He goes, when I was in, in junior high, I stole a bunch of pencils from a store and I got caught. Uh, my old dad, my old man made fun of me, my friends made fun of me, and it was awful. And I go, okay. And he goes, but it goes away. And he goes, you give it a couple weeks, um, something else will happen, and people will stop paying attention to you, and it gets better. You understand? And I just went, yeah. And he goes, all right, I'll see you around. And he just walked away. And it was weird. I, not what I expected. It was one of those conversations that you just don't forget. And then he just left, and he was right. It was. Another week or so later, something else happened. Kids forgot. The only ones who still made fun of me were my friends, because that's what friends do. Uh, but like all the other kids in the school, they moved on, and it wasn't like a big thing to them anymore. And so it was a tough one, but it, it made me who I was, and it made me stronger in the long run. And so that was um, the second time I got arrested at 14. And I didn't get arrested again for four more years uh, until I turned 18 uh, and I was a freshman at, at college and I went down to IU and I went through all of high school uh, not drinking and not doing drugs because of the whole my family having addiction issues and the whole previous arrest thing and I even though when I turned 18 which my birthday still hasn't changed it was in May so at the very end of my senior year I was like I know it says it got wiped out but I didn't want to like risk it and then like be like 18 in five months and be like, hey, now's the time to test it. So I was like, eh, let's not really find out. So I didn't try to really break any rules. Freshman year down at college, um, living at a, a dorm called Wilkie, and I made a bunch of new friends at, at this dorm, and I was hanging out with them, and, and things were going well. And um, one of my friends named Mo, uh, his real name was Mariah, but his nickname was Mo, Bo Simmons. And he was uh, turning 19, he was a little older, and all the guys on the floor wanted to throw him a party. And I was like, all right, and I was like, I'll throw a party for him, it sounds like fun. But their idea of a party was they were gonna go out and buy a whole bunch of beer, and then bring it up to our dorm floor. But at IU, you can't have alcohol uh, on the dorms at all, it's what's called a dry campus. So anywhere on campus, regardless if you're 21 or not, you can't have alcohol. And so I was like, and I was still like 18, four months. And so I was like, eh, I'm probably not gonna go to that. And they're like, come on, man. Uh, they're like, you know, we want to have you hang out. I was like, I can't. I have like, I told them, I was like, I got picked up when I was in high school. And I was like, I can't be around it right now. They're like, oh, they were actually really cool about it. And they're like, oh, not a problem. We understand. Like, but we have a problem. And I go, well, what's the problem? And they go, well, we have no way of getting the alcohol. We have a kid that's 21 that's going to go out and buy it for us. Uh, but we have no way of going and picking it up. Can we use your car? because I had a car when I was in college. It was one of the only kids in my dorm floor, because most kids don't take it down there. I had to pay a bunch of extra money to go and take my car down and stuff like that. And I had a Mazda RX-7, which was a two-seater, uh, here, there, and then it had like this flat area in the back. Uh, and of course, being a teenager, we would pack as many kids in the back of the car as you could. You'd pop open that back like that, and we'd drive to the mall with like three kids, like smashed in there, and there's like a little clown car at the back pop up, and they'd come flying out of it. Uh, dangerous as all get out when you're a teenager. It's like, who cares about danger? Uh, and so they were talking, and I was like, all right. I was like, I understand you want to use my car, but I don't want you to get arrested with my car, because that seems dumb. How about this? I'll drive you, but then once you guys pick up all the alcohol, 
um, I'll just separate and then that way it would be all right and that way I don't you know get in trouble with my parents for like loading my car to someone so I was afraid to get in like a car accident or like rear end somebody and not be on my insurance and I get yelled at so I was like that doesn't sound like a good idea and they're like all right that sounds good so it was me this 21 year old guy who I'd never seen before who lived on our floor and then the guy throwing the party a kid named Fish uh, Joshua Fisher um, and Fish was nickname real witty um, and so it was the three of us I drove the 21 year old sat in the passenger seat and then Fish sat like in this little cramped area just like all back in there and we drove around to these different liquor stores and uh, they collected money from all the guys that were coming to the party and they bought a whole bunch of beer a um, uh, hundred some cans they had like those big like cases that you see like the pop comes in and it was like they kept putting them in there was enough like the back of my car kind of like sank down a little bit uh, and they just kept putting it in there we weren't dumb we uh, had a blanket we did a blanket over the beer because smart uh, and so we were driving around but the more we picked up the more nervous I got because I knew having it in my car was bad and the fact that I could get in trouble for it and so eventually I was like hey um, let's go drop off what we have I think we're doing pretty well and they're like all right let's go drop it off and so we got back to my dorm um, in this car uh, my dorm was Wilkie is what it was we had this little parking lot and then you had to go all the way over here and then take an elevator up and we lived on the 11th floor which is like right over in that area and so we parked in this back parking lot and I parked almost exactly where that silver car is right there uh, and so we pulled up and parked and I was nervous because I knew the whole, I still, was like I was 18 and four months, and you know, it was supposed to be wiped off my record. I didn't know what was going to happen. And so I was like, hey, um, I'm going to uh, go up and get the other guys so they can come down and get the alcohol because I figure I won't be around it. I'm just going to leave, and this way I don't sound like a wussy. So I'm like, I'm just going to, you know, go get it. Does that sound good? And they're like, all right. So I'm like, all right, I'll see you guys later. Uh, and so I took off walking this way to go over to get the other guys. Um, and Fish and the other guy, the 21 year old, had this big duffel bag. Uh, they opened it up and they were like just throwing the cans of beer into it, the idea of just carrying the beer up in duffel bags, uh, like it was luggage or something like that. And so they had the back of my car popped open and they were just throwing in all the, the, the beer and stuff like that. And as I was, it was at night, found 10, 10 30 at night, walking across this way, and I got like right to this area as I was walking across, uh, and I heard two guys off to my left go, hey! Where are you going? And I look over to my left, and it's two cops just walking through. Because at IU, you have these foot cops that just like wander around trying to find kids doing idiot stuff on Saturday nights. I was a kid doing idiot stuff on a Saturday night. And so they flip on like a flashlight and shine it at me. I'm like, um, going up to my dorm right there. And they go, oh. And their, car, their flashlights went from me, swiveled to the right, to my two friends over at the car. And they go, what's in the car? To which my friends took a blanket, threw it over all the stuff in the back of it, slammed the back, and then nonchalantly leaned against the back of it. And I went, stuff! <laughs> Witty. Uh, and they go, well, why don't you come over here? And I went, no. <laughs> that seemed like a bad idea, because there was bad stuff over there. And so I go, no. And they go, I think it's a good idea if you do. And I went, okay. <laughs> so I sort of walked over back to where they were, and the 21-year-old and Fish were like just leaning against the back of the car, looking as not suspicious as you can look. And the cops walked up, and they're like, so um, what do you have in there? And I just went, I don't know, car stuff? <laughs> Seemed like a good answer. Uh, and they shined their flashlights in there, and you could tell there was a blanket covering a big lumpy pile of stuff. And they go, what's underneath the blanket? I go, I don't know, car stuff. I really could not think of a better answer at that time. And they go, why don't you open up the back and we'll take a look at the car stuff. And I go, no. Because <laughs> I'd seen cop shows and I knew I did not have to open the back of that car because I was a smart 18 year old. And they go, you're not going to open the back? And I go, nope, not going to do it. And they go, all right. I'm like, Oh, that was easy. And they go, here's what we're going to do. And I'm like, oh, there was a follow-up. Um, they go, we're going to stand here behind the back of your car, uh, and we're going to call a tow truck. Uh, and we're going to have a tow truck come. We're going to tow your car down to the police station. And then when we get down there, we're going to have a locksmith uh, bust open the back of your car. And then we're going to take a look in there, and we're going to open up um, 
all of the, the, the back of it, and we're going to lift up the blanket and see what's underneath there. And if there's anything uh, illegal underneath there, then we're going to come back here, and we're going to arrest you, and then you're going to have to pay for the tow truck, you're going to have to pay for the locksmith, and you're going to pay to have the car impounded. If there's nothing under there, then we'll apologize to you, it'll be all our fault, and you can come down and pick up your car. How's that sound? And I went, uh, uh because I knew there's illegal stuff <laughs> underneath the blanket. So it was pretty much be arrested now, or wait till later and be arrested, and have a bunch of charges put on top of it. So I'm like, oh, that's not a good choice at all. And so I went, I'll, um, I'll, I'll open the car. And it was once again that, uh, so I got out my car keys and put it in there, chink, chink, and it popped open the back. And the two cops, like, leave, like, that was a good choice. So I'm like, uh, you're not yet, it wasn't. Uh, and they reached in there and they put back, they threw back the blanket. Things that stick with you to this day. I remember both of them stepped back going, oh, and then they cussed at the same time because there was so much beer in the back of the car. <laughs> and they looked at each other and they go, well, whose car is this? And both Fish and the 21 year old went, his, and pointed to me because it was my car. I considered for a moment not claiming the car and just being like, I don't know whose car it is. It just must be a random car in the parking lot that I just found the keys to. You can have it, like throwing them just like walking away. But I had a feeling my parents would not approve of me just throwing away a car. So I was like, yeah, that's, um, that's my car. Uh, and the police officers go, oh, then, and they turn to Fish, the guy throwing the party, and the 21 year old, and they go, you two are free to go. Uh, because they're in the free because not their car. Technically, they didn't do anything wrong. They were just standing next to a car that was full of a bunch of illegal stuff. And they go, really? And the cops go, unless you want to stay. And they go, nope. And they just, whoop, they just took off. And they go, you're under arrest. And I went, oh, are you kidding me? And so once again, I got turned around. I uh, got the frisking, got the handcuffs put back on again, clickety clickety. And then I had to sit down on the little curb. There's a little curb that's right there. And we're sitting on the curb. Um, and while they sat there and they called in a car to come take me uh, into custody, and I could sit there on the curb, and you can look up from here, and I can see my dorm, and we were up on uh, like the second to the top floor. And as I sat there, I remember seeing lights turning on, and then all my friends coming to the windows uh, that were supposed to be throwing the party for, and them all being in the windows looking down, and like them like waving to me and stuff like that. Um, and I could just sit there in my handcuffs and just be like, you guys are hilarious. Um, and so I sat there until eventually this police car pulls up, uh, and they unload all the, the alcohol from my car into the back of the police car. Um, and then I remember the police car had a headlight out, which I always thought was weird. I was like, oh, that police car is a pedidle. It's kind of weird. So we call that car with only one headlight. And I remember getting into the back of it, and this time I didn't ride in the front seat. I had to ride in the back seat because there were two cops that took me down, different two cops. Um, and the back seat was, was hard plastic. Um, it was not like cloth like you have in normal cars. It was like a like a picnic seat kind of thing. It was turned, and it had a spot for your hands. So it had like a, a normal seat, and it had like a little divot. So that way when you had your handcuffs on, you could sit down and you don't crush your hands. You have like a little divot for your hands to go into. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Uh, and I found out on the drive, because I mentioned, I was like, why are the seats all hard and plastic? And they go, well, we pick up a lot of kids that are drunk and they throw up in the back seat. So we just have to hose it out. And so it's like this hard plastic, and apparently kids drink a lot in college. And so when you throw up in the back seat, they just open the door and go, and just spray it all out. And they just close the door again. I was like, oh, kind of genius. And they drove me down to the police station. Uh, they got to keep all the alcohol. And I got my mug shot taken. Um, once again, the whole, uh, which means somewhere out in the world, there's a mug shot of me in the Bloomington Police Department. Uh, me like holding a little, eh. Uh, I only had to do the front one. I had to do the front and the side. It was just like me standing in front of this little thing that took my picture. Uh, and then they just kicked me out. And they're like, we'll come back and contact you. And then I had to leave. The irony of the fact uh, that I did not drink uh, and had not <laughs> drank ever uh, at this point in, in my life. And the fact that I now was being arrested for an alcohol charge was ironic. And it was that irony was not left on me. And to make it even worse, that night I was supposed to go to a party because uh, there was a girl I had a crush on at college. And so I was supposed to go uh, hang out with this girl. And I was like, that's ah, not happening. Because uh, I still could have made it to the party in time. But I was like, I have no desire to go and hang out at a party because I'm going to go home and cry. 
because uh, once again, I was like, I didn't know if my record, if it was still on my record from the previous arrest, or what was going to happen, or what happens when you get arrested once you turn 18, because they don't contact your parents, because now that I was 18, technically I was legally on my own, and so tomorrow we'll finish out the last bit of that and get into the final road talk. Take off!